Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, gathering where uh, we are going to introduce some new work that uh, NCR, the National Council of Applied Economic Research, uh, has been doing for some time. Um, the uh, broad context, of course, is in uh, the efforts uh, that India is now making and has been making for some time to improve the investment climate. This, of course, has had a big impetus under the new government starting in 2014. And we've seen a number of new ideas, uh, all very well put together and all uh, very broadly projected around the country and the world, uh, all intended to show that uh, India is emerging and, and is a very uh, good destination for investment. Uh, this, of course, applies as much to foreign direct investment as it applies to domestic investment. As we all know, we are a union composed of uh, 29 states plus union territories. And really all the investments that we think about and talk about have eventually to find a place in some state or the other. And this focus on states has been something that's there, it's under the surface, but hasn't really been um, projected as much and emphasized and explored as much uh, as uh, I think is warranted. So NCR, when, when thinking about this, uh, decided that we ought to look more closely at the investment climate in individual states and uh, come up with simple measures uh, for gauging on a number of different parameters uh, how states uh, uh, are placed in terms of their attractiveness for investment for for investment into the state. Uh, this has led to NCR State Investment Potential Index, which we are uh, uh, going to share with you today. Uh, this is our first attempt. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be tremendous learning from this discussion today. Uh, and I'm sure that there are going to be major refinements as we go. As with anything, it's important to make a start. And I think the timing is propitious um, because the interest in India is uh, at an all-time high. Uh, obviously, when there is a lot of interest, there's also a lot of surveillance and scrutiny, which is appropriate. Uh, people are looking at all the minute details and they are looking into things that perhaps might not even have been of concern in the past. Uh, but uh, it's very, very important that uh, that think tanks and, and institutions like NCER uh, begin to contribute in as rigorous and as evidence-based way as possible. Um, the idea that uh, evidence should drive uh, the kind of rankings or the kinds of uh, assessments of the investment climate. This is, of course, uh, in the uh, tradition of work that has been around for a long time. All of us are familiar with the World Bank's ease of doing business surveys, uh, which for many years really didn't have traction in India. And uh, it was uh, a very uh, important and distinct change in the attitude of the government when uh, the government and particularly the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion took it upon itself to say, well, let's learn from this index. Let's actually use this index. And the collaboration between the IPP and the World Bank has been really quite profound in thinking about the action plan first, the 98-point action plan, I think, and now we are at 340-point action plan. And in September 2015, um, the IPP uh, released its assessment of the progress made by states on that 98-point action plan. So this is really part of a sea change that is happening in India, where uh, rather than hide behind we are sui generis and we are distinct and we are separate and therefore we should not be measured, we really want to enter into the community of nations which basically says, look, let's uh, stand up to the competition. And I think this is a very uh, uh, welcome, very uh, positive, very constructive way to looking at the investment climate issues. Um, so I'm very pleased that uh, we are here today. Um, and I'm uh, privileged to have the Secretary, Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion, uh, Ramesh Abhishek, with us. 
Um, I'll just briefly introduce him. Um, before uh, I hand over to him, I also want to acknowledge with um, gratefulness the support of the British High Commission. Um, and uh, Claire is here representing the British High Commission. Um, uh, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office has supported this work. Uh, we are very grateful for that support and we hope to continue this work um, in the years to come. Uh, there's going to be a lot of refinement, I'm sure. I'm sure there'll be some errors in what we have done, uh, but this is part of the process of learning that uh, we all need to be uh, uh, engaged in. Uh, this is too important a subject. Uh, if uh, our states that are already at the forefront can move up the uh, production ladder in the production frontier and move on to higher and more value-added complex products and services, and then the states that are still lagging can occupy the space that is, uh, that is uh, vacated by these advanced states, uh, the entire nation will benefit, and more than anything else, the common man will see opportunities and the common woman will see opportunities that we have not yet seen. So this is all part of that aspiration uh, of our founding fathers that this union, this union of India, should be composed of progressive, inclusive, and liberal and uh, caring states that, that worry about the opportunities that are available to the common man and common woman. I also want to introduce uh, Dr. Indira Ayer, who is the team leader and who has really uh, played the seminal role in both designing the index as well as leading a team of people at NCER uh, to do this work. And, and she will present the report and the findings in the session, in the first session, immediately after the opening session once we release the report. Uh, as I said, I'm privileged to have Ramesh Abhishek with us, a member of the IS from the Bihar cadre, uh, currently, as I said, Secretary Industrial Policy and Promotion. Prior to this, he was uh, the um, head of the uh, uh, foreign, um, the Forward Markets Commission, the FMC, and in between, of course, he was at the Cabinet Secretariat as the Secretary for Performance Management. Um, in the FMC, uh, he oversaw the major uh, issues uh, that emerged in the commodities market, successfully uh, managed that very difficult process, uh, which uh, I think uh, most administrators would wish would not land in their career, but uh, yeah, Ramesh uh, uh, was the right person at the right time in the FMC in handling the uh, reforms of that market which were uh, badly uh, overdue. Uh, he's held a whole series of other uh, important uh, uh, appointments in the government um, and uh, he also has a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School uh, and uh, a MBA in finance and a MA in international relations. So uh, 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 administrator with scholarly ambitions and uh, a scholarly background. We are privileged to have you here Ramesh. Thank you for joining us and I also want to thank uh, your entire team in DIPP that has been extremely helpful uh, uh, I know that Mr. Shailendra is not here, but Dilip is here, uh, and others are here from the ministry. So we are really grateful for the DIPP to uh, be able to guide us and extend their support throughout this work. Uh, it's really been a remarkable collaboration. We are looking forward very much to further strengthening it. Uh, Dr. Mr. May. Uh, thank you, Shekhar. Uh, good morning. Uh, let me first thank NCAER and uh, Shekhar for inviting me uh, on this very important occasion. And also I would like to congratulate uh, NCER the, and the team of Indira for uh, doing this uh, excellent and very timely study. We know that uh, uh, government is very committed to improving ease of doing business in this country. And this is one of the primary objectives of the DIPP World Bank initiative as well as in the Make in India initiative as well. We want to reduce the legal, regulatory and procedural complexity associated with doing business in India. Any business, particularly those in manufacturing, must comply with an excessively large number of laws, regulations and go government to business services as well as a very large burden of annual inspections that are undertaken regularly. 
our honorable prime minister has elucidated his vision of converting red tape into red carpet to support this vision the ipp is working with all the central government departments and ministries and the state governments to drastically streamline the laws and regulations and make them available to the public simplify application forms and processes and take them online preferably through single window systems and now some states are doing single roof systems as well streamline the inspections regime by introducing risk based approaches and offering self certification and third party certification alternatives to low and medium risk businesses in this spirit back in the make india make in india workshop in december 2014 chief secretaries of all the states agreed to a 98 point reform agenda that will fulfill the above objectives and that was the beginning of the ranking of states for the first time in india in ease of doing business the, the ipp has been periodically monitoring the implementation of these reforms for last one year since the last report was brought out and as shekhar mentioned now we are monitoring a 340 points agenda or action plan on which the states are giving regular feedback to the central government this uh, last year's report assessment of state implementation of business reforms done by the world bank was really a landmark and we have been uh, finding since that states are very enthusiastic and there is a very healthy competition among them to bring about these changes we felicitate ncer for uh, this very important report for two reasons first the findings of the report clearly outline the importance of the reforms that we have proposed to the state governments corruption getting approvals before starting a business and getting environmental clearance these have been cited as the top 3 constraints of business in your report these are exactly the areas that dipp wishes to address as part of our ease of doing business initiative secondly this study provides very useful feedback from industry and business on the reforms that the states have taken so far our objective is not to promote reform for reform's sake but to ensure that reforms are being felt by and are of benefit to business and this study actually sees whether what is the perception of the industry and the business so far as the process of reforms is concerned i would like to state that i am very happy to see that the results are quite different from our own ranking of states last year uh, in the beginning it was uh, of some concern to us before we had got down to the details of what this study is all about because we thought that it may send some very uh, diverse uh, messages to uh, various pot potential investors but the two studies the contents are so different that they supplement each other very nicely this also shows that there is so much room for improvement even among the states that were ranked highly uh, last year in the world bank report and there if that they will be now incentivized to undertake transformative reforms that make it truly easy for business in their states one of the uh, couple of suggestions i would like to give one is that uh, the states must get some uh, like we have given them a 340 point action plan if i know when it's a like issue of perceptions it's not so easy uh, to give any action plan as such but then if they can get some uh, measure of how they can progress in this area so that after all the purpose of the exercise is to improve things so i don't see in some way if states can be given some kind of you know uh, idea about how they can improve and one more session that we will give to states after this survey is that they should be actually getting regular feedback from industry and business about their initiatives uh, my uh, colleague from world bank is here and i'm sure he's uh, making a note because uh, they don't need to wait for this survey or any survey they should be in regular touch with the industry business and find out how their reforms are being uh, accepted or whether they are doing enough or whether because when we make changes in the government we feel very happy but whether the users are happy or not i think we should have a regular process uh, at at the end i am very pleased to be here at the launch of this report and i look forward to a very lively and engaging discussion on this topic thank you thank you ramesh uh, for those uh, very encouraging words and very supportive words uh, 
and I think the suggestion uh, for uh, taking this forward and having further drill down discussions with the states is something we will definitely take on um, and uh, perhaps work with you as well uh, when you have such gatherings or you make such uh, meetings possible we may also come in and make a contribution at that point, perhaps talking about the underlying uh, uh, data that uh, has been collected for this, uh, for this index. Um, I think you made the very important point, and thank you for making it, that this is entirely complementary to the ease of doing business survey. Um, truth in advertising, since I know the survey extremely well with my 25 years in the World Bank, um, I, and, and having been th there at the genesis of this, uh, this survey some 10, 15 years back, whenever it started, um, the, the thought very much here was that we don't want to duplicate something that is, that is very focused and very much on processes on the ground, the time it takes to do this, the time it takes to do that. But really, uh, do something, and if you take the analogy of flight, then we are at 35,000 feet looking down on the terrain and seeing where the lay of the land is, where the hurdles are, where the policy framework is taking a state. The ease of doing business is about landing and takeoff. Um, you know, you then want to know how soon your wheels will hit the ground and what your braking uh, uh, pressure will be, and you know when you cut off the engines. So. I think the two are entirely complementary, um, and uh, I'm very pleased that the bank is also here and will be participating in this uh, conversation. Um, what I would also wanted to add very much is that uh, we hope to uh, take this forward in ways in which uh, the states, and, I, and, and I'm very glad that several state representatives at the highest levels are here with us or will be with us uh, towards the end of the day, um, and I'm looking forward very much to their responses. Uh, this already builds on a conference we held in September with uh, resident commissioners of many states, so we had very important feedback from them but I'm sure that we will have further feedback from them, uh, both from the states that are ranked high and from the states that are ranked low. And we are prepared, obviously, uh, with open uh, minds and, and, and open ideas about how we can incorporate uh, the, uh, the feedback that we get today. Um, uh, I think we are on time. Uh, we are perhaps even a little ahead of time, so just as well. Uh, I'm going to now request the team to take over and uh, Vishwanath uh, Goldar to take over as the chair of the uh, session. Before we do that, we have to launch the report, of course, so we have a little bit of a ceremony, which we will do. Um, but then I'm going to request uh, Professor Vishwanath Goldar uh, at the Institute of Economic Growth, who's been a member of the advisory panel. By the way, I should have mentioned uh, that we've also benefited greatly from an advisory panel. Uh, I see several members of that panel are here. Uh, Vishwanath Golda himself uh, uh, from the Institute of Economic Growth, uh, a, a long-term friend of NCER, and his work on productivity and manufacturing, I think, is uh, a kind of global best in this, in this area. Uh, for India. Ashok Jha, who is also here, former Secretary, Ministry of Finance, former Secretary DIPP, uh, and a number of other important positions. Um, uh, Shailendra Singh, unfortunately, I think you ordered him to go to Cairo last night, so he's somewhere on a plane or, or, in, or in Cairo. So he's not able to join us. K.P. Krishnan, I think, will be joining us later on, and Partha Pratim Mitra. Uh, I don't know if Partha is here. Uh, he, he will be joining. Yeah, okay, very good. So I just want to thank the Advisory Council also for their help uh, uh, on this report. Uh, Viswanath, can I just pass it on to you?
good morning this is the first session uh, and i understand in this session the main uh, uh, findings of this study will be presented uh, i'll not i'll just briefly say something um, before uh, the presentations are made uh, it was mentioned that there is uh, one sort of rankings of states was done uh, by the world bank uh, dipp study that has primarily in my to my mind primarily focus on policy but this work besides considering policy is also considering the what we say the ground situation in terms of availability of resources infrastructure of course policy is one important component in that sense this complements the uh, world bank study another aspect of this study at least potentially it seems to me is that this will be a regular feature so there have been one off studies on the ranking of states or the uh, uh, investment climate long time ago there was a i think world bank uh, cii or some some study ranking different states and giving scores which i had used in some of my own research but this i think is great opportunity where a ranking comes every year and states can see what is their position and are they improving in their relative position and because a uh, lot of action is possible and required at the state level that way it will be an important contribution so let me now invite the authors of the report uh, to make their presentation uh, beginning with uh, indira indira go ahead indira is there a time yes, linked yes. so uh, what what I sort have, of time you have 12 okay and, uh, okay first let the presentations com get completed then i will Uh, thank you, um, uh, Professor Goldar, uh, and th thank you, um, uh, Mr. Abhishek, uh, um, and everyone for coming here today. Um, and uh, in in particular, I'd like to thank my team, uh, Maithili and um, Poonam, um, are equal partners in crime in this. Uh, so uh, they are sitting right there. um so uh, on behalf of all of us and we have a very um, uh, a very young and energetic team on behalf of all of us i'm i'm uh, i would just be presenting the uh, our first ncar um state pot investment potential index um we have called it ncp uh, 2016 and next march we hope to see you in ncp 2017 um um the uh, uh structure i'm just going to give a background and scope of this project briefly touch on the methodology uh what what does it actually have the five pillars and the findings and the overall ranking of the states and the movers and shakers under this ranking the global context being competitive at the state level today is far more important so india is the third largest market in the world is the fastest growing market in the world amongst all the major emerging market economies it has got a very favorable demographic dividend in fact the imf estimates that if we reap that favorable demographic dividend our growth prospect will not just be 7.5 4 to 7.8 percent. There are various estimates on that, but we would actually increase it by another two uh, percentage points in real terms. Um, we are also improving globally in our competitiveness index. So the global competitiveness index again has 10 broad pillars, um, which are uh, at uh, uh, also takes a um, uh, mix of um, uh, fundamental and some perceptions. the world bank ease of uh, doing business we are moving up we are now in the 130th place but with so many state level reforms and and so much happening next year we really have we hope we are far more uh, at least 110 if not in the double digits how how is and 
how is NCP, sorry for the typo, and the World Bank uh, DIPP index, like uh, Mr. Abhishek just said that, to put this in the broader canvas, NCP is more policy and structural backdrop. It gives you the broad picture, it takes uh, the economic fundamentals, the, uh, the labor situation, the infrastructure. Uh, it also has a perception-based um, pillar. Um, so the, what drives business? Why would, for instance, say a Bill Gates locate in Odisha versus Karnataka or a smaller, smaller business, where would they locate? So to, it gives you a composite measure. The World Bank DIPP uh, index is more procedure and transaction driven. It's easier for business. So they, they measure different things, but they're very, very complementary. So both increase state level competitiveness. So they have to be seen in unison. How easy is it to do business? And what are the ground level realities in doing business? And what is the potential for the state to do business? Sorry. Uh, the end, what is the context? Essentially, the, back, the background of uh, this is that, um, uh, I'm sorry about the, you can't read it, but uh, we expect a, a, the NCP um, index to be something which is easy, easily replicable, transpar transparent, and reliable, which can be used every single year. And in particular, when states are vying with each other to attract investment, um, we hope that NCP gives you a sort of a backdrop where you can make decisions. What is the methodology that we've used? What was our objective? And based on that, we have our five pillars and our 51 indicators. Our objective is to, is to give a composite measure, a, a comprehensive measure of how states rank on a number of parameters. We, we selected the appropriate method, methodology in this. We went through a lot of methodologies. And um, in, we finally chose the UNDP standard of uh, minimum maximum approach and normalizing. Uh, the uh, human development, the simplest, easiest to understand, and there is no controversy. The normalization of indi individual indicators, we scale them all one to 100. So when you see the scores, you'll find that you are either 59 or, or 80, or it's all on based on one to 100. We gave them all equal weights across the five pillars, and we did a large number of validation and consistency exercises, including some principal components uh, exercises. We removed some indicators, we put the indicators so there's no bias in our indicators. Uh, so this part of our exercise actually took a long time. So we, uh, at the end of this, we feel that it is very consistent, very reliable, and very fair. So what are our basic uh, basic indicators? We have uh, in, um, we have five pillars which are factor driven, um, which is labor. Uh, we do though land is a factor of production. We have not uh, included land uh, in this because it's very difficult to get comparable data. As all of us know across all the different states by how much land is available, how much is what is the price, what is the uh, you know spatial distribution of land. We have efficiency driven, which is infrastructure. Uh, then we have growth driven, which is we, which we measure by economic climate, and political and stability and governance. And then we have the last index, which is actually, um, which is very novel in all types of indices. We have a perception driven. Okay, should I, you know, you generally know, okay, maybe I want to go to Gujarat or Chhattisgarh or, you know, Karnataka or Tamil Nadu. You know, these are types of places you want to be. Uh, they drive up our index. And we find very interesting results when we uh, add this. And this, um, what is a perception driven index? That's a fifth pillar. It's a very unique component of NCP. Um, you know, it is constructed using a very extensive survey across 21 states uh, in India. And it is a fifth pillar. The, the respondents. For example, one of the questions, this is our very first question, how many people do you find it difficult to acquire land? So it gives you the ground level, level realities, like one in four people said they had a problem in acquiring land. And then we have a whole lot, um, a whole lot of questions. We have two types of ranking. Uh, one is called NCP 21, 
and this is our fundamental ranking. So NCP21 is the, has all five pillars and since it was done in 21 states it's called NCP21. NCP30 is for the remaining nine states. The states which were not covered by NCP21, uh, the remaining nine states are basically uh, of the seven north uh, northeastern states, we covered only Assam because it was raining and we didn't have enough time for the other six states. Then we did not cover Goa, Sikkim and Jammu and Kashmir. So that makes nine. So apart from the uh, Goa, Sikkim, Jammu, Kashmir and six northeastern states, uh, all the other states have been covered uh, in our surveys. Our first pillar is labor. So what does the labor pillar indicate? Uh, we have uh, the labor, um, you know, has an, uh, 10, 10 indicators, sub indicators on the labor pillar, and basically these sub indicators cover labor availability, labor quality, labor competitiveness, and labor climate. So, labor availability is the amount of people actually looking for work, and labor quality is basically. How many in your state are vocationally trained? What is the education level? Labor competitiveness is wage rates in the you know in the manufacturing sector, wage rates in industry. You know, in for instance, uh, if you are a uh, small and medium enterprise, you want you are looking at what is my wage rate, minimum wage rate, that is there in different different parts of your um, uh, different parts of your subsectors in industry. And we have labor climate, which is your labor turnover ratio, you know, which sort of measures the business climate. Are you hiring, firing, accession rates? Uh, so we try and capture all of this. Uh, we find that across our 51, we have 51 indicators, and we find strong correlations, um, again, part of our uh, consistency exercise and also f part of very good economics is that, for instance, we find education and per capita GDP across all the states very strongly correlated. So this is, and we also find, for instance, labor mobility and labor laws. We find that, for instance, per, you, you would think that labor laws are something which are a constraint to business. In our survey, labor laws are really not. And labor mobility actually has nothing much to do with the uh, whether labor laws are restrictive or not. What are our rankings on labor? Our top guns, Kerala comes top in terms of labor based on our parameters. Tamil Nadu comes second, Karnataka is three. Very close seconds as far as having availability of labor, quality of labor, a good labor climate. We have Gujarat, Odisha, and Uttar Pradesh. Uh, we have miles to go. We have Delhi, Bihar, and Haryana at the bottom. Our next pillar is infrastructure. Uh, infrastructure measures, you know, how well uh, the the competitive environment, how connected you are, the connectivity. Um, access and the growth potential. Now, connectivity is by roads, ra roads, railways, seaports. We have competi uh, how um, uh, competitive is, is your infrastructure by way of tariff rates, uh, how your access by how many bank branches there are, by uh, growth potential is basically, uh, we have in this, uh, a, a number of uh, a number of indicators, including the smart cities, because they are sort of uh, 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 magnets for growth. So we have normalized. We we collected the data and normalized, and we could we could discuss that later if if we um, have time. Um, and we see that in general, if the more ICT, we also have ICT readiness uh, in our compet in our part of our competitive competitive. Uh, uh, part of our thing. ICT readiness is an NCER index, which we have, you know, whether you have computers, laptops, whether offices are using all this, and we find that 
uh, how ready, how how well placed the state is. Um, you know, the uh, the service sector GDP, the growth in service sector GDP and ICT readiness are very very strongly re related. And uh, of course, a service sector right now is about 66%, so ICT seems to be very fundamental. We also find that access to credit and getting ease of credit, there is actually no correlation. Um, uh, ease of getting credit is a perception. So we have asked people, you know, is it easy to get credit? We are small and medium enterprises, they feel no, but we find that they're bank branches, so that we find that though there are all these bank branches that uh, the in, uh, small and medium enterprises. Most of our, we will, Puna will be talking about that uh, a bit later, who are our, who, who we surveyed. <coughs> Infrastructure, Delhi comes top, Punjab second, Gujarat third. Um, we have Uttarakhand, Kerala, and West Bengal as far as the uh, infrastructure is concerned. And uh, last, as far as infrastructure, Rajasthan, Jharkhand, and Uttar Pradesh. A third index is the economic climate. Uh, in this, we have uh, tried to capture a vast variety. We, I think we have 13 sub-indicators under this. Um, so we have, um, this is the perhaps uh, wrong, uh, wrong uh, slide for this, um, my mistake. Uh, um, so under economic climate, um, we have tried to capture uh, macroeconomic fundamentals, the uh, government, how effective the, go the government is, uh, the market demand, and the resource endowments. So macroeconomic fundamentals is by um, GSDP, per capita income, rates of growth. Uh, we have um, you know, government policies by way of development expenditure to total expenditure. We have VAT productivities. Uh, these are just some some of them. Uh, we have, uh, as far as market demand is concerned, because demand is a big driver of growth. We have tried to capture that with um, with the demand in million plus cities, in uh, and growth centers, and also we have tried to capture that how many how close are you to metro towns. So we have to composite indexes of, you know, how to capture market demand. And we have resource endowments by way of your, uh, you know, availability of coal and uh, availability of uh, various other resources, minerals. Uh, so we try to have a composite score on that. Um, we we have also the DIPP's index ease of doing business as one of our governance index indices. So if you see VAT productivity and the ease of doing business. Um, there's a very, very high co correlation. So states where, uh, where uh, we, the productivity of VAT is very high, um, you, they score very highly on ease of doing business. And VAT productivity is a sort of a composite measure. It sort of measures um, both exemptions in VAT and also how efficient you are in collection, collecting VAT. Uh, so and also corruption. So it's a sort of a composite index. So we find that you know uh, the DIPP score and VAT productivity that sort of gives us a very good indication that of those states which are doing well. We also find again survey d data favorable industrial policies as perceived by small and medium enterprises are very strongly correlated with development expenditure in the state. So if the state is spending more on roads and is spending more on uh, other infrastructure, health and education, um, the people, the businesses feel that, that from a perception index. And it's a very, very strong correlation across all the states. Uh, how do states rank here? The top guns is Delhi, followed by Andhra Pradesh and Maharashtra. We have Gujarat coming in at number four over here, <coughs> Telangana and Tamil Nadu. And then we have Punjab, West Bengal, and Uttar Pradesh as have some something to catch up. What do we have in the our fourth pillar is governance and political stability. So what do we try to capture here? Uh, it, this is a very composite index. So here we are trying to capture a large number of uh, uh, 
uh, factors here. One is our law and order situation, uh, crime, corruption, government efficiency, and political equity. Let's start with the bottom political equity. Here we try and uh, try and see how many seats that the majority party have uh, as a percentage of total seats in parliament. Uh, we also, this is the latest, like as of last month. Uh, then the other thing we try to capture here is how many of your politicians have a criminal background? This is from, you know, data from your Lok Sabha releases, press releases. So, uh, you know, you d you may not want to be in a state where, you know, there's more, uh, uh, more uncertainty as far as your representatives of state or the how strong the government is. Uh, law and order, we have police strength, uh, we, for instance, crime, we have tried to capture it by both economic crime, economic offenses, um, as well as cognizable offenses, um, corruption, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, how many, how many cases have been booked under corruption, how many have actually been uh, dealt with, and then uh, we, uh, we have um, uh, gov uh, government efficiency uh, also over here. And um, here we deal with uh, essentially uh, how, whether you have e-governance systems, whether you have, you know, uh, business reforms, for instance, uh, DIPP score would come over here. So we have tried to capture a whole lot of composite in indices. Um, we find here that per capita GDP and e-governance are very strongly correlated. So more the governments which are more going online, the, give, making it easier to pay your taxes, you know, are, are growing faster. This is an uh, this is a perception. We have stalled projects and perception of ease of doing business. So, in states where there are greater number of stalled projects uh, due to land related issues, we find that you know there is uh, uh, they they feel that you know it's not easy to do business. Uh, so this is a perception based uh, index based on various uh, our survey how do the, how do the states rank here gujarat is number 1 on governance and political stability followed by tamil nadu and madhya pradesh we have chhattisgarh very close over there um, haryana karnataka and we have himachal jharkhand and bihar um, having some catching up to do this is a uh, um, uh, uh, 21 state perception based index. Uh, we have tried to capture the very, very uh, comprehensive survey, and we have tried to capture a large number of issues which small and medium uh, businesses, which are our primary focus over here, uh, are very interested in. These are labor related issues, land related issues, uh, infrastructure, business expectations, and political stability, how they view it. Uh, my colleague Poonam will be talking more about this. And for instance, we, if you, this is at the composite All India level, we have state le statewide uh, breakups too. For instance, if you look at availability of power, you know, it's severe, about 15% uh, and moderate. It's viewed as a constraint by about 40% of the of businesses, and about 60 feel that is not a constraint. So we've tried to capture uh, this too. How do, uh, how do uh, states rank on a good industrial climate? Gujarat comes first, followed by Rajasthan, followed by Chhattisgarh. The, the perception of doing business um, and being a good business-friendly climate are in these three states, followed by Uttar Uttarakhand, Andhra Pradesh, and Madhya Pradesh. And we have Ut Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand, and Punjab having some catching up to do. So we put all our five pillars together, and um, we um, have, like I said, two scores, NCP 21 and NCP 30. NCP 21 are the 21 states where we did our last indicator, this, uh, the perception-based um, index. And um, so it has five pillars. And uh, so we have under 21, labor, infrastructure, economic, governance, and perceptions. And NCP 30 is where we have only four pillars, which excludes the perception-based index. How do states rank here? These are all the 21 states. Um, we have Gujarat, uh, number one, followed by Delhi, uh, 
Tamil Nadu and uh, we have uh, we have Chhattisgarh at number 7 Odisha at uh, number 16 of and Jharkhand at <coughs> number 21 How do, how do states do if we remove the perception based pillar? So there is some movement, um, you know, in, in the fundamental structures. If you look at all the fundamentals that drive investment decisions, uh, we have Delhi as one, Gujarat as two, followed by Tamil Nadu. Uh, we have some states moving up and some states moving down because perceptions matter. Uh, and uh, you you will find over here like Man, states like Manipur um, and Nagaland also rank fairly high. They're moving up a bit uh, because we have a, comp, a score for 30 states here. <coughs> what happens when we are looking at perceptions? Because perceptions matter, and uh, so states which move up the ladder compared. So we are comparing NCP 21 with NCP 30. NCP 21 is without perceptions. So we find the states with move up where you think there's a business climate is good, uh, along with your strong fundamentals uh, and your potential for investment, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, and Assam. And states that move down because, uh, you f uh, because of uh, the feel that the perceptions, which ranked poorly on the perceptions are K Kerala, West Bengal, Punjab, and Odisha. So these states um, f um, actually um, move down if you if you remove the pillar on perceptions. Um, so states that sort of maintain the ranking are Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra, and Karnataka. They are very very exact same ranking. Whether or not you remove one pillar or the other, they maintain their ranking. So we have all these indices out there. So how do they compare? So what we have done over here is we have ranked our NCP 21, which is a fundamental index with the DIPP World Bank Index and, the, and our survey index, just our perception one and the third one in the blue. Um, in all, Gujarat comes one in all the three uh, indices, whether it's NCP 21, which is based on five broad pillars, the DIPP, or a survey. Uh, Delhi comes two in our index, but in uh, DIPPs it's 15, and in a survey of 21 states, it comes 12. We've just ranked seven of them. For example, Chhattisgarh is for us number seven in our index, but it's it, it's high on the DIPP index and it's high on the survey, which tells you if you if you put these things together, if you start consolidating things together, it means that if Chhattisgarh, for instance, improves its fundamentals, ra road, railways, economic, labor, climate, um, it's going to go up as being very competitive. Uh, we have Odisha, I think, as number nine here. I didn't have time to put the slide here. Uh, I mean, I didn't. Uh, for for presentation sake, we have those comparisons. But um, what this tells you is, for example, Karnataka are very, very strong on fundamental, but it has a, some way to go as far as your ease of doing business. So it, they don't really match up. And Karnataka is not really perceived as being a very good state to invest by, if you, if you look at the last column of blue, which is our survey, uh, survey column. So one needs to look at this in complementary ways. So if you're not doing very well on your fundamentals, but doing well on your, on your, on your uh, perceptions and DIPP score, um, then you might want to look, pay more attention to improving your potential and, your, and the base for business and vice versa. Uh, I'll take it, leave it to my colleague who will give us, uh, Poonam, who will uh, uh, carry on giving us more details of how we did our perception based um, index and give you very, very interesting um, results on uh, based on our surveys.
Thank you, Indira. Good morning, everyone. So I'll take you through the um, through the survey findings, and as Indira said, this is uh, perception is uh, one of the five pillars that we have used in the construction of NCP 21 index. Uh, NCP 21 is called NCP 21 because survey was conducted in 21 major states. Um, uh, the objective of the survey was to, to get the perception of uh, industries on uh, various indicators. Various, we, we have covered almost all the indicators which are already there in our, uh, in our um, other pillars of uh, NCP. So we have land-related issues, we have labor-related issues, infrastructure, governance. Uh, we are also asking questions on business climate, investment climate, and other challenges, political stability, and where would people like to move, if at all, given an option. So uh, if, if I, uh, just a brief on the survey features, geographical coverage, uh, the survey covers 20, 20 major states and uh, union territory of Delhi. Uh, we have 1,011 units across across all the 20 states and one union territory of Delhi. The survey was conducted during August-September period of 2015. Uh, method of data collection was questionnaire based. There were face-to-face -face interviews, uh, and the target group were medium and large-sized firms only. So all the firms uh, with annual turnover of over rupees 10 crore were only surveyed for this particular survey. Again on sample coverage, um, uh, private limited and public limited firms are actually the major, uh, they, they occupy the main uh, you know, part of the, uh, the, the coverage. Uh, and across industry types, we have tried to cover most of the uh, you know use-based categories of industries and infrastructure and services. So they are they are almost lying between 20 to 25, or uh, actually uh, sample coverage by size of firm. 56 percent of them were uh, had annual turnover of rupees 10 to 100 crore. Um, and 17% were over 500 crore annual turnover. So uh, as I said, there were various questions, uh, land-related questions. On land-related, we, we asked the respondents whether they found problem in acquiring land in their particular state. And we found that 27% of respondents thought that acquiring land was a problem in their state. If we see the result across the industry types, Capital goods and infrastructure uh, industries uh, were the biggest sufferers. They found the 32 percent and 30 30 percent of these industries thought that acquisition of land was a problem, whereas consumer durables is on a little lower. Uh, 22 percent of them thought it was a problem. Sorry. Then we had uh, uh, we had questions on labor, infrastructure, and governance. I'll take you through all of them, and I'll I'll just uh, present top five states and bottom five states across all the constraints. Uh, we we had a fairly exhaustive uh, list of uh, 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 constraints, and the correspondents were asked whether they found these constraints as severe or moderate or no problem at all. Uh, on the basis of that. Uh, availability of skilled labor in in their state. Uh, top five states are Gujarat, West Bengal, Rajasthan, Uttarakhand, and Chhattisgarh. Uh, in fact, these these do uh, look like top five, but if you look closely, I mean, Chhattisgarh. Even in Chhattisgarh, forty-one percent of uh, respondents thought that availability of skilled labor is is a problem, whether it's severe or moderate. But it was a problem. Uh, and bottom five states is like Karnataka, 87 percent of respondents thought that skilled labor was a problem in their state. Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Punjab, and Jharkhand. We, we also tried to compare these perception uh, based findings uh, with, our, with our official uh, you know, standard, uh, secondary data statistics that were available on these, these indicators. Uh, Availability of skilled labor is actually one of the indicators in our 
uh, our, under our labor pillar also so uh, when we look at the look at the statistics then the top 5 states uh, below the below the first uh, chart are kerala maharashtra himachal pradesh tamil nadu and punjab so we see that uh, for for most of the indicators the perception and the the official data not really converge uh, so there, there could be some states which 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 are almost which are common in both perception and hard code rea the ground realities and the the fundamentals look appear the same but on most of the indicators they they really are not so there could be availability of labor but industries do not uh, see it as a as a ease so for, uh, as far as their operations and businesses is concerned quality of skilled labor uh, again comparing this with our with our official the, the statistics that we have from uh, nss rail connectivity gujarat Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Assam, Haryana. These are these are top five states when it comes to rail connectivity, and bottom five states are HP, Bihar, Tamil Nadu, Jharkhand, and Uttarakhand. But but uh, the the reality, I mean the 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 data suggests differently. Uh, Uttarakhand, Delhi, West Bengal, Punjab, and Bihar are actually the top five states when it comes to rail connectivity. So so it it uh, it really uh, shows that probably the rail density or uh, uh, we come to other indicators also road density or whatever they they do they are uh, okay in a particular state but but uh, but industries do not find it so uh, you know no constraint or they, they really thought that it was a constraint when it comes to their business operations road quality or road connectivity is again one of the infrastructure indicators and we compare these with the the, the statistics availability of water we are comparing this with the net groundwater availability um, that we have under infrastructure in one of uh, in under the ncp index availability of power uh, in gujarat punjab himachal pradesh chhattisgarh andhra pradesh uh, 17% in andhra pradesh thought that availability of power was a was a constraint to them and when it comes to bottom five states, Bihar, 90% of respondents thought that availability of power was a problem. Uh, again, comparing this with the, we are comparing this with the power shortage sub-indicator under, under infrastructure. Access to finance is compared with the, with the bank branches per lakh population that we already have, which is one of our sub-indicators. Political stability. We are comparing this with, uh, uh, with uh, as Indra mentioned, with uh, largest uh, the party which holds the largest number of seats in a particular state. Law and order is uh, law and order top five states, and uh, when we compare this with uh, uh, with the indicator which is police strength, police strength is a, a pointer to law and order in a in a state. So this is this is how the states rank when it comes to perception and uh, the the fundamentals. Getting approvals before starting business, we are comparing this with DIPP scores for uh, for getting approvals and for getting cl environmental clearances. Such kind of indicators we have DIPP score as a proxy to such indicators. Corruption. Corruption is actually one of the uh, uh, indicator which 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 ranks the highest among all the states. I, I'll show you another chart which shows that uh, rank, the corruption is actually the biggest problem across all the states. Then there is perception of business condition. Uh, the respondents are asked whether the business whether they perceive the business condition in their states to to be better or worse or same. Uh, six months down the line, this is how the results show. 46% of the respondents think that the business conditions are likely to improve over the next six months. Then perception of financial position, 48% of respondents thought that uh, the financial position will improve uh, over the next six months. And investment climate, 53% uh, of respondents thought that it's going to remain the same. 
respondents were asked whether if given an option they would like to uh, relocate to some other state and we found interesting results here 31 percent which was the maximum uh, thought that Gujarat could have been the better option to move to given a choice uh, followed by Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and AP Telangana because at the point of our survey AP Telangana was a combined state so this is this is the the ranking of the 22 constraints covering all la labor infrastructure and governance issues uh, we asked our respondents to uh, to pick five of these 22 constraints and rank them from one to five <coughs> so this shows that corruption is one um, uh, one constraint which 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 is actually everywhere I mean I mean most of the respondents thought that it was either a rank one problem or rank two problem three four five so we thought we found that corruption was indeed the biggest uh, uh, constraint that all the industries were facing in their states putting them all together this is how all the constraints uh, uh, they, they look related to each other 79.4 percent of respondents overall across the country thought that corruption was uh, a, a constraint to, to their business operations whether severe or moderate uh, interestingly availability of unskilled labor and labor relations uh, raw material does not appear to be too big of a constraint as compared to governance related issues um, Thank you, thank you. That's that. So I'm coming from survey. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we'll now move to the uh, three discussants. Uh, uh, but before that, uh, just to sum up, as you saw, the index has two components. There are four pillars which are based on secondary data which is the sort of facts on ground on which and there is a fifth component which is based on perception. You also saw that a lot of places the perception and the ground reality do not match. You may be having very good rail connectivity but the businessman thinks it is not good enough. So in a way perception does play a role and it is, it is indeed useful to include it because perception can provide more information than what the statistics, secondary statistics brought out by the government can do. Now you have seen the way these indices, the five pillars, then they are being aggregated and overall ranking of the states are coming. And what was I think quite striking is that certain states which were ranked quite high in terms of 21, speed 21, uh, but in the DIPP World Bank Index, which is based basically on procedures and bas policy primarily I could say were not ranked high or the reverse could be there. Uh, so these are interesting nonetheless as we said and Shekhar said in the beginning and also said in the beginning uh, in my this session that they have a complementary role to play and if some states everything is good but in terms of perception people are not feeling there is something that needs to be done. Oh. And uh, so uh, with that let me now invite the uh, three discussants first. Uh, now we have uh, now about uh, how much time? We have about 45 minutes. Yeah. So it will be uh, Indira, how much time should I give? 10 minutes, 5 minutes each? Or 10 yeah, minutes okay. each? 10 minutes each? We uh, will not have much time for the question answer then. Uh, okay, 5 seven to 7 minutes, min 5 to 7 minutes each. So each uh, discussant please take 5 to 7 minutes each so that we will have time for the audience to ask some questions on the. Uh, uh, now let me invite uh, Mr. Ashok Jha. Thank you. I think the I first must compliment NCAR in bringing out these two indices. Uh, they would be very useful for potential investors. As we all know, the entire system of competition among states to garner investments really kicked off uh, post our reforms in 1991. Many states devised their own methods of uh, attracting investment, but I think these indices, first uh, the DIPP, this action plan, 
as well as the indices that have now been brought out will give an institutional framework for investors to go by when they're looking at investment possibilities. Since I've been given just about five minutes, so I'll be very brief, more, more like in uh, telegraphic uh, kind of form. My f I have a few comments on the study. The first comment relates to the weightage. Now, we have very comprehensive pillars that have been assigned to work out the indices, but uh, each pillar has been given the same weightage. Now, quite obviously, I can understand from the point of view of uh, procedural calculations, it is easier to give weight, equal weightage to all the pillars. But uh, I'm not very sure whether in actual life equal weightage would really stand the test of scrutiny. Uh, for instance, supposing there is a labor intensive industry. Now, this industry would obviously look at labor productivity, labor relations much more closely than, say, a capital intensive industry. For a capital intensive industry, the more important parameter could be, let's say, the availability of power infrastructure. So, therefore, the equal weightage aspect probably needs to be reconsidered. The second aspect that I want to raise is that in India, a lot of industries come up in the form of uh, clusters. You know, you have, for instance, the hosiery industry in Tirupur, uh, the tanneries in Kanpur or uh, near Chennai, the auto industry in around Delhi, Tamil Nadu or uh, Maharashtra. Now, these have all come, come up as clusters. What would happen to our uh, ranking if we were to factor in these clusters? You see, for instance, uh, now if you take the auto industry, and I'm sure <coughs> Dilip next to me would agree, that uh, in many cases, the auto industry has developed without uh, really looking at the economic factors for location. For instance, in Delhi, the auto industry developed because a particular gentleman wanted to set up an auto industry and he happened to be based in Delhi. Now, around that, you know, you had the entire clusters coming up. And the, and the interesting thing is that in the auto industry, you know, there is no manufacturer really today of automobiles. They are, they are merely assemblers of uh, components. So once an automobile manufacturer sets up a shop somewhere, then he's ringed with, around with all the component manufacturers. So to that extent, location of industries gets, uh, you know, if you can call it distorted in terms of the pure economic factors. The third aspect that I want to highlight is about government policies. Although there is a mention about governance, et cetera, in the pillars, but government policy can and does distort uh, location of industries. For instance, if you have tax breaks, for backward regions, for hilly regions, and so on, then quite obviously the location of industries would get uh, affected by those tax breaks. <coughs> Fourthly, I think uh, you know there is a misconception that if you are looking at attracting FDI, all we have to do is to liberalize all our policies. And once we liberalize, then there'll be a long line outside our door with people wanting to come and invest. Now, we had looked at this uh, liberal policies of FDI sometime around the late 1990s. And the conclusion we came to was that the most liberal FDI policies were not in Asia, not in Europe, not in America. They were in Africa. Some of the African countries had the most liberal FDI policies at that point in time but they were getting very negligible FDI. So the point I'm trying to make is that policies per se do not ensure that uh, investment shall happen. Then the last two points I'll go quickly because they've been covered already. <clears throat> One relates to access of credit. Now, it has already been mentioned that, uh, you know, it was found that the number of bank branches 
per unit of population is no guarantee that uh, credit will be available, particularly to SMEs. Now, this is a very important uh, conclusion because a lot of government policies are based on the premise that all we have to do is to open bank accounts or maybe bank branches and uh, financial inclusion will happen. So this I, I consider it's a very important uh, finding. The last point I want to make is again very briefly about corruption. See that the, uh, I think it has been brought out that the biggest handicap everybody perceives <coughs> is uh, corruption followed of course by very closely followed very closely by the uh, difficulties in starting a business. Now both these are issues which to my mind are re quite reasonably and they can be addressed if the government has the will to do so whether it's the state government or the central government because uh, all one needs to do is remove the very eager inspectors from visiting the factories and basically for starting businesses instead of having a pre-approval make it a post-approval uh, phenomena. I think uh, I'll stop here. I may have exceeded my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jha uh, for making comments within the time I gave and we save some time there really. Um, you have uh, rightly, correctly, rightly pointed out that uh, uh, there is an issue of clusters which of course this index to my understanding does not take into account and there is also an issue of tax breaks and certain states Uttarakhand etc may be able to attract a lot of investment because of the tax breaks. How to incorporate that remains an issue in the index. Uh, corruption was pointed out uh, in the perception survey I think 80 percent of the people said corruption is a big issue. Unfortunately, NSS does not collect any data on corruption. We don't have any secondary data on corruption. I, I don't think we can really have an official survey trying to find out and which business will truthfully be saying how much money he has paid to whom. But uh, so this has to be perception. Unfortunately, perception is one of the five pillars. And within that, it is one of the indicators. So perception becoming the biggest hurdle gets a very low weight in the ultimately in the index uh, that is being made. Let me now invite uh, uh, Mr. J.S. Deepak, Chairman Telecom. Yeah. Mr. Deepak is five to seven minutes, please. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Golda, TGNCR, and Indra, Ramesh Abhishek, colleagues. Firstly, let, my, let me start by complimenting NCAR on bringing out this index. It is insightful in many ways and I'm mindful of the fact that there are a number of index indices going around but it looks at things in a different way especially the per perception survey. The way I look at MCP, I have five six points which I think really commend it. One of course is the fact that in this day when we are looking at outcome based uh, management Benchmarking is extremely important. We know we need to know where we are and in the direction in which we are going. So this kind of uh, index based on uh, in-depth, including an in-depth survey and looking at some of the, the most critical parameters is extremely useful. The, the use of the Perception index for governance and for stability, I think, is something which marks this index out. And uh, being from UP, I mean, I can say that we have empirically experienced the correlation between stability and progress, as well as between corruption and instability. You know, and the close I would say relationship between the unproductive rents which industry has to pay and the perception of corruption, including within the bureaucracy for which a number of surveys have been done, is something which is being brought out in this index and I think that would be valuable to industry and to investors. The fact that it is being done by NCAR and it's an independent index is something again which I find uh, find remarkable and I hope that NCAR would take 
make efforts to disseminate it and use it for advocacy. Having said that, there are a few points which I would like to highlight, which I think uh, is increasingly becoming a problem. One is, of course, of multiple indexes, multiple indices. Now, th I think we need to soon have an index of indices because what is starting to happen is that people have started cherry picking, you know. You pick what you want from this and from that, and it creates a lot of confusion. I mean, uh, famously, as they say, as a drunk uses a lamppost for support rather than illumination, it's beginning to happen. Looking at Jharkhand, for instance, I have seen an index, I think it was the World Bank, the IPP one, which shows that Jharkhand has become the third best for doing in the ease of doing business. And there are long, large billboards in Delhi saying that it is the state to work in. And here Jharkhand is almost at the bottom. So that is a problem which confuses people like me. <coughs> The second thing is that I think while you have looked at services sector, it has by and large been shortchanged in this effort. I mean, services constitute 67% of GDP, 50% of FDI that we receive, 40% of employment, 40% of trade. It's an important sector. And uh, though it has been put as a sector, I mean, giving it the same weightage as automotives or retail or something, the retail is part of services in a sense, but is perhaps not giving it full justice. The third thing is, in the ease of doing business, we look at things like how, we, how quickly you can start business, how do you get licenses, permissions, etc. One thing which perhaps has not been done in any index so far is the ability of government and local self-government institutions, including utilities and municipalities, as well as Panchayati Raj institutions, to provide services. I know of states where the structure of the municipalities is such, and their resource base is of the order of 10% of their expenditure. The national average, I think, is 11%. How do they provide services which they are supposed to? And increasingly, social infrastructure is very, becoming very important for businesses. In the state of Uttar Pradesh, in the area of Bundelkhand, 30% vacancies in health education. One eighth of people in position in the Panchayati Raj sector and the rural development sector in most states because of policies, incorrect policies of recruitment. Now, that the Finance Commission has decided to devolve 286,000 crores to these bodies, it's important to be able to judge and track the effectiveness in providing services. I think that's an important area which these indices need to do. The fourth point, and being from the telecom and the electronics and IT sector, is about the sunrise sectors. Now, we have this make, of in, make in India vision. The objective is to have 25% of GDP through manufacturing by 2020. This assumes a 35% rate of growth of manufactured exports. And looking at the global situation, it's not happening. It's down, if at all. So the only way that manufacturing or make in India can become real is based on domestic demand. And the domestic demand will come from basically electronics consumption, which would be $400 billion by 2022. Telecom, which would be a $300 billion sector and IT and IT services as they become more used in the domestic economy through Digital India and other programs. And it is here that they have special governance needs. For instance, compliance issues, exit policy, how to raise risk capital, which state makes it simpler for raising risk capital, etc. Maybe if these parameters could also come into indices, it would be useful for people because these are sectors where growth rates are of the order of 30 to 40 percent. E-commerce is 47 percent. Fifth point is about regulation. Now, we do say that the business of government is to keep government out of business. But what is the impact of regulation? Is light regulation, is there a correlation between light regulation and growth or ease of doing business or industrial units coming up rapidly? or expanding fast. It has been dwelt with to a certain extent. And even the ICT readiness has been dealt with. But the more important, perhaps, is 
end-to-end electronic delivery of services which makes it easier for business. You know, ICT readiness would come from numbers of computers and states which have large metros will have lots of enterprises and hence larger number of computers. So maybe that is an area needs to look at. Finally, again in the context of the electronic sector, and today we are on International Women's Day, the availability of women is part of the workforce. <coughs> there are a number of cases where electronics manufacturing is moving because women are not available. Shri City manufacturers of mobile phones are moving out of Shri City in Andhra to Tirupati because all the women who could be given employment and their preferences for women for employment with the necessary education and skills have already got employment. So maybe these are also certain factors which have a bearing. All in all, I would compliment and see AER for this great work. And I do hope, as I mentioned, that it would uh, result in a robust dissemination and some advocacy for uh, getting states to change policies or to alter their governance structures. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deepak. Uh, very valuable points uh, were made. Again, just trying to summarize what, what, how they connect with the rest of the discussion. I think the one issue that was raised was is that most of the discussion here and thinking of behind the index as if we are thinking of a manufacturing plant, always power, land, manuf but to the extent that a good deal, a large part of the economy is really services. So this index that way doesn't exactly fit in with that. But uh, initially a point was made by Mr. Jha that why you give equal weights because depending on a manufacturing or services, <coughs> the weights could be quite different. I think this is one direction in which one can go. While there can be an overall index, they, out of the indicators, perhaps an index can be created which is specifically directed to manufacturing activity or which is specifically direct. But there is more thinking maybe in the next round when we see NCP 2000. 17, besides the overall index, there will be an index for manufacturing and index for services enterprises and quite weights could differ between manufacturing and services, a point which you made. Of course, there is an issue that uh, uh, there are sunrise industries and the way the economy is going, can we, that get reflected, which is I think also a very valid point, but it is not clear to me. But one way in which this study is really doing that is that each year there will be a special focus industry. So you can pick up telecom or whatever other industry which are sunrise and go in more depth into that, going beyond and like the issues of exit policy or other issues were raised. So this is again within the study there are two components. One is the index, the other is other is the sector specific research, and each year a different sector, particularly the sunrise sectors, could be picked up. And uh, so from time to time, this could be revisited. And that would certainly add uh, to the work. Now let me now uh, uh, um, invite uh, Ms. Claire uh, Tinte Irwin, uh, I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> British High Commission. Thank you very much. I have the advantage of going third, so some of my points have already been made. So I'll try and keep as much time for, for questions and input from the audience as I can. Um, I also would like to start by thanking NCR as an enormous amount of work has gone into this. Um, and I think that it does move us forwards. I mean, we talked about the drunk and the lamppost, but at least let's have lampposts which are sort of firm that the drunk can lean on, um, rather than wobbly or indeed just in his imagination. So um, I think it's good that we've, we've got to that level where we're starting to look at things on the basis of evidence. Maybe different indexes look at different kinds of evidence, but let's move beyond anecdote, move beyond perception, um, and have some evidence uh, to go on. So thank you to NCAR for taking up that challenge um, and producing such a useful piece of work from it. Uh, I'll just make a, a few points. I mean, I think I was just interested that Professor Goldar just drew out this sector focus, which we didn't discuss in the presentations, but I think for me is a very important part of the work this is doing. It's really important that an index like this is actually helpful for decision makers working in real businesses, in, in real industries. And I'd encourage everyone to look at the, the three sectors which have been chosen for this initial survey, which are automobile, pharmaceutical, and Indira, help me. <laughs> Retail, um, and they will be different each year, so um, that really helps draw that out. I think the other point, sort of moving back to, to what Mr. Jar was saying, um, is that not every state will be the same. We already have these clusters, but there's a limited point in every state trying to compete for the same kind of industry um, in the same kind of area. And I think what this index brings out by looking at some of the fundamentals in states in terms of resource availability, um, in terms of connectivity, is 
underlying that message that there will be different kind of industries that will be suited to different kind of states, and that's fine. And hopefully the information in this index, and I think it's good that it's breakable down by pillar. I also was going to comment on the equal weighting of the pillars. I won't go into that. But I think the fact that the pillars are separate and you can look as a business at each individual one and decide which is important for you um, is quite important in making that real as well. I thought one of the sadder messages from the perceptions work and was touched on in one of the presentations was remaining scepticism about whether any of this is going to change. I mean, I think the fact we're all here in this room today really underlines the energy and the impetus that's being put by the current government and by many, many state governments around India into changing this. But there is still a perceptions problem if you think that 53% of businesses don't believe that there's going to be any improvement in their business climate. Um, and you think that 11% are expecting it to get worse. Um, that's, that's quite a shame, um, and I think all of us can do more to get that message out that things have improved. I noted in the text of the report that there's a comment that actually the indicators show that over the past six months there's been improvement. So why aren't business feeling that yet? Um, another couple of points, again, on power of perception. Um, we saw very briefly at the end of the presentation just how huge a swing perception gives Gujarat in particular. And I think as more and more states are trying to run big investment promotion events, trying to present themselves more effectively, it's worth states thinking about why has that happened? How has that happened? Um, how is it important? And I thought it was a brilliant question that the team asked businesses in each state, where do you wish you'd set up your business? Um, and I was just interested to know, maybe uh, the team can come back in discussions, when you asked businesses in Gujarat, where do you wish you'd set up your business? What did they say? Um, because clearly Gujarat's got this very dominant position in terms of people wishing they'd set up there, but I was just interested um, in what businesses in Gujarat thought. Um, lots and lots of people have commented on corruption. Um, that was really powerful for me too. You hear it a lot anecdotally. It's really helpful to see it come out like this in a survey um, as being so important. I was interested, again, in Professor Golder's remark that despite that, because the perception is only one pillar, overall in terms of the weighting, it's not, it's not being that um, significant in forming the index. But I hope that this is a result that, that government and policymakers take seriously and do consider uh, what more, beyond some of the practical measures like automation and use of IT, can be brought to bear to significantly reduce this. Because at least in terms of perception, it's a real issue for so many businesses. Um, I know this is a frequent uh, complaint from foreign business, but I would also emphasize only 3% of those companies were MNCs. So this is Indian businesses saying that they're having issues with corruption. I think we do need to take that seriously. Um, just a couple of points under the remaining pillars. Um, on labor, we didn't see it, but there's a very interesting chart, and again, Mr. Chanoy may have thoughts on it, about correlation between vocational education and growth, uh, which is, again, quite strong, but with some really interesting outliers. So the state with, for example, the best vocational education has very low rates, and the state with the, the worst is high. So where are those outliers coming from, and how useful will that be in terms of thinking about the government's correct emphasis on improving that? Um, Access to credit has been brought out again. I mean, I would just say that's such an important uh, element. Uh, it's so interesting to see that disjunct between the focus on access per se and real access to credit for business. And I think the RBI's latest uh, financial inclusion paper starts to draw us more towards that. Um, but I hope we see more, more focus and interest in that in future. Um, infrastructure, again, perceptions. Um, how important roads and highways are in perceptions of infrastructure. They really come out. Um, is the key one. That obviously vindicates um, some of the government's focus on that. We heard about that in the budget last week, but also wastewater treatment. That's traditionally been rather a poor relation, I think, in terms of infrastructure um, provision. I was also interested to see concerns about power generation come so far down the list of the 22 indicators on constraints. That was something I didn't expect to see. Um, and despite the fact when you actually correlate it with growth, there is a strong correlation between power availability and growth. So I just wondered from a real on the ground business perspective, does that reflect the fact that people are getting around that, the fact that they're using their own generators, um, or does it reflect actual progress on tackling this issue um, in various states? So I thought that was interesting to see. Um, and the last and uh, I thought very encouraging message that I would pick out, and it speaks to something that Mr. Deepak was also talking about, is a strong correlation between favorable industrial policies and actual expenditure on development, which makes me, I hope, optimistic about your point on service provision. Um, it's something that, as economists, we sort of feel instinctively would be there, but it's often something that we're challenged on as governments and as policymakers, and there's this 
uh, opposition set up between favourable industrial policies and, and development expenditure. I thought that graph was particularly helpful in drawing out the underlying good governance and effective provision that can lead to both of those things, as well as, of course, tax receipts then improving and giving you more room uh, to have that money to spend. So I'll leave my comments there because we've barely 20 minutes left for questions. Um, but thank you again to NCR. I thought it was fascinating. Thank you, Claire. Now uh, let me open it up for the questions and comments from the floor. Yeah. Dilip Shah from Indian Pharmaceutical Alliance. I have one question for Mr. Deepak and one question for Mr. Jha. The question. Any well, this is related to that, but uh, since the observations came from them, I'm directing the questions to them, but uh, NCRs can certainly come in. There are certain sectors of industry like telecom, pharmaceuticals, gem and jewelry, where state's policies or regulation have very, very little rule. It's entirely governed by the center. Now, in the measurement which is done here, uh, if that taken along with other sectors of industry, how does that help? Corruption everybody has talked about and Mr. Jha also spoke about it. We are talking about corruption at the inspector level only, which my perception is only constitutes 20 percent of the corruption in terms of value. The real corruption lies at much higher level which constitutes really the chunk of uh, uh, corrupt practices in this country. Now, how do we measure that? And the third question is to the NCER, that just as you are ranking states, can center be evaluated against the states? Thank you. Okay, what we'll do is that we'll uh, first collect uh, two or three questions, and then we'll have one round of answers, and then we for yeah, please and Uh, I think the uh, it's a, uh, the most valuable takeaway I have uh, from this whole exercise is I think the part that has been alluded to by the others, which is relates to the mismatch between the perceptions and the actual uh, you know the objective indicators, and this I think has actually sheds a light sheds light on a number of policy conundrums that we are facing. For example, everybody has been talking about labor reform. I think if you try to reconcile what is being done, what has come out in this, the differences, you will find that we may be barking up several wrong trees. The, so I, I'll come back to elaborate. Second point I would like to say is that I think this is the first stage, and I'm looking forward to it. I think we really need to get into the bottom of what are the drivers of the ranking. The ranking seems to. Uh, have four drivers. One are what I call resource endowments. The second is there's a high correlation. Uh, I'm afraid, uh, Indra, I don't agree with you. Many times you use the statement, if they have this, then they grow faster. Actually, almost all the evidence shows, both in India and overseas, that it's the other way around. What are high income growing faster are the ones that you will find whatever is happening. Let me give you the third aspect of this. Is, is This is very criti critical for drawing the right policy implications. And this is, um, I can give the example, let's take since Mr. Chanoy is here, the skilled labor part. We talked about Karnataka saying 80% of them feel that they are short of skilled labor. On the other hand, all the objective indicators. No, because what you're mixing up is elementary economics, is that wherever there's a huge demand, the supply is not catching up. And until you get to the bottom of that, you'll get into wrong. A lot of governments will set up I I ITIs, whether it is. It may not be the right one. They may want to go for different things. We had last week at NCAER another such indicate the health seminar that was given, which basically said all the evidence pointed to X, which is that primary health centers are not working. However, all the policies based on the same data were saying we need to pour more into it in precisely the areas that were not. At least that was the message of the seminar. I am afraid we may be doing the same here. Fourth one, I will skip on that, which was given, you can see coming from NASCOM, the manufacturing versus services. I think this also drives back to this business about, uh, you know, what are the key drivers. 
let me just give you a very simple example. Some things, for, you know, it's like, you may say electronics, Mr. Deepak mentioned electronics. It's not just a question of electronics. For example, if you look at East Asia, some parts specialize in manufacturing LCDs. Others specialize in manufacturing motherboards. And this is, you can follow the evolution. How does that, how, and that's what industrialists, when they are looking at location decision, the things that influence those decisions are what matter. And I think to, uh, I think the next stage should get into this issue of which I, I would call it services part of that. Lastly, uh, I have a whole bunch of small ones, but I don't want to take up time and I'll follow up with the details. But land, I think, ignored in the first one. Labor competitiveness is uh, and labor climate, we need to look at again. Uh, let me, I have 20 more, so I'll skip, I'll stop here. Thank you, Anupam. Yeah. So, can I, do I have a third? Yeah, this gentleman there. Okay, I will have four. You will be including the first four. Yeah, please go ahead. Thanks very much. Uh, Indira, excellent work. Uh, not only the quality of the work which uh, we have gone through, but I found the document very readable. Uh, now that is something which always doesn't automatically happen. Excellent work, but it's also very readable. And I'm sure the full report will be even more so. Really enjoyed it. Uh, clearly articulated. Uh, three very quick points. Uh, I must say that uh, the perception part, I think it's a real good value added in this whole work because, you know, you go through many indices constructed with all the issues that the chairman also had mentioned, but I was very impressed with the depth of the perceptions. And there, something that I had talked with many people in the recent months and many told me at very serious sort of, at very senior levels of the industry that you know, corruption has certainly come down, certainly at the highest levels. And uh, that heartened me, though I did find it difficult to believe. And then your results disheartened me, though I find it easier to believe. Uh, but this is something that perhaps we can talk a bit more. And I think Anupma made some very good points along that score. Uh, I take a point that Mr. Cha made. I think that's an excellent point. Uh, I noticed that. You know, you have got on the top five in the you have got about three of them are really policy oriented, legal environment, policies, tax environment, etc. But Mr. Jha made the point that you can have the best policies and he gave the example of African investments don't go. But I think that basically shows which other need both. But the right environment is a necessary condition. I think the point is not that you don't need them, but I think your point is very well taken that it's not sufficient. Uh, but I think for the state level policy makers in there, I'm sure you'll go down into the dissemination. That will be a very, very important point for them. So basically it shows there's a lot of work to be done at the policy making level. And I, it was, I think, Deepak, you mentioned about the correlation between stability and investment, which is a very, very important one. Uh, my third and last point, and we'll, we'll get into more details later, is, uh, you talked about the labor competitiveness, and I know that I think Maithri, you will present this later, so I'll just start, or Puna maybe. Uh, you talk about the wages, and you talk about higher minimum wages are better from a social point of view, but bad from an industry point of view. First, I disagree. I think high wages is probably good for business, not only just social. But more importantly, maybe I'm missing it because and this is not the detail. Productivity. I would rather pay more and get more productive labor. And I think this is also a point that Anupam was alluding to yeah. when you were talking about the supply chains. So some of those things when we drill down. And my fourth and last point, I was very pleased to see that you have actually not drilled down state-wise, but sector-wise, because ultimately that's what. But then uh, Claire mentioned something which, are you going to change the sectors year to year? Are you? What, Yes, uh, we would be doing, most probably take up on Deepak's uh, suggestion. I can see the benefit of industry. Yes, I yes. can see the benefit of it, but the biggest advantage of a study like this is you keep the same sort of indices I can look at. Now, what will happen next year is you look at something else, so automobile industry will say, we're doing everything they said and everything is fine. But anyways, that's a, uh, I, I know the constraint, you can't, but I would strongly urge to keep a consistent set for comparison purposes. That's a major challenge with all indices. And 
international organizations that I belong to once are famous for that. Just because we form a time series and then before we can get held accountable, we change the series so nobody can really know what we did. But overall, uh, great work. Uh, this, is, this is something NCAR can be very proud of and Indira, you and your team have done great work. Please go ahead. Uh, Anupam, please uh, switch off the mic. Yeah. Really? Ah, yeah, fine, fine. Thank you, and uh, it was wonderful being here, and I believe that it, this is a great improvement over the ease of doing business uh, parameters which were, which were being advocated by the DIPP, in the sense that uh, perhaps uh, the other, other one, uh, the EODB parameters did not uh, really capture the point of view of uh, the investment climate, they did not uh, capture the point of view of uh, the availability of skilled labor which are the basically uh, the parameters which uh, any investor would use in order to uh, take investment decisions. So I, I, uh, I, I know that there is a terminology difference that uh, the, the ease of doing business is basically on the processes and this one is on the state investment potential index. So I, I congratulate the NCER, a fantastic job done. Now I would only like to have uh, two or three comments. One is uh, that uh, uh, I think there should be sector specific uh, uh, studies as well, like if you are talking about uh, electronics or if you are talking about the research and development or uh, you are talking about high growth sectors uh, and sunrise sectors just as pharma or some somewhere else, you could find some of, some, some of the states to be more suited. And, uh, um, and maybe for manufacturing and for heavy infrastructure and ports and some others, maybe other states are more suited. I think that point has uh, not uh, been taken up. I think it can be done in the subsequent studies and, and that would be very relevant from the investor perspective. The second point I would like to mention is uh, about the availability of skilled labor. I think the point which uh, 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 Mr. Khanna was talking about, uh, uh, I, it would really perplex me that Karnataka, 87 percent of the respondent felt that it lacked a skilled labor availability, whereas perhaps this is the factor which has led people to invest in Karnataka in spite of maybe some other constraints. So I, I think we need to uh, perhaps delve deeper into this issue as to why uh, that uh, is the perception and uh, how we can perhaps uh, uh, address those issues. Uh, perhaps yes, ITIs uh, are perhaps not relevant. We need to have something more to it, and uh, how we can uh, how we can work on that to improve that kind of uh, climate. And uh, finally, uh, perhaps we need to also have a, a review of the 340 points which have been circulated by the DIPP, sir. I would request Secretary DIPP to have a look at it because we feel it is uh, too much of uh, detailing on uh, certain points which perhaps uh, gives them much more weightage as compared to what other issues are. So I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, now let's uh, have uh, answers, uh, replies from the, um, the team. And uh, then maybe Mr. Jha and uh, Mr. Deepak may save a line each because some questions were asked for them. And if then if we have time. But before that, I think we give the, t do we give Mr. Jha first? I think the team should be given for the first opportunity. I have been a silent member so far. Maybe I should stick my neck out and take whatever brickbats come. So I am just going to focus on two or three very key points where I take away from the comments. One is about why the same weightage was given. The second that I thought was a key thing was why have we object not included services. And then the third one was a mismatch between the objective and the subjective parameters. I think these are the three main, there have been other many points and we have taken them all away. In fact, I think they are very useful. When we do it next year, we will certainly keep them in mind. But I think these were the three main things. Before I start my reply, I think I must emphasize once again that the whole idea of this index was to get a simple, comprehensive index, which is just an initial number. So in the process of getting something that is simple and comprehensive, it is quite possible that you have to give up on some kind of granularity and finesse which would be there in the index otherwise if you were to take in every single element. So there is always a trade off between something that is very you know simple and uh, uh, at some level I would not call it superficial but does not get into depth primarily because in search of simplicity you always have to compromise a little bit and how deep do you get into the different sectoral differences etc. So as far that brings me and that is why I think we opted for a 
same weight across all the pillars. Because it is true, as Ashok mentioned, that the importance of a labor intensive industry and a capital intensive industry, the pillars that you take, the weightage might differ. But then how do you kind of do it? Do you take it sector wise for each sector, for each state? So again, in the interest of simplicity and getting a comprehensive number, we thought it would be better to run with the same weight across all pillars. Otherwise, it would become too complicated. Okay, in automobile, maybe it's not labor intensive power sector again not labor intensive so do you do it sector wise so again in the interest of getting something a simple index which is just the initial go to index so anybody wanting to make an investment decision trying to decide where to go if it is a labor intensive industry he would look at those the labor pillar if it is a capital in intensive industry maybe he'd look at the infrastructure pillar so it was in this quest for getting the right trade off between simplicity and a number that kind of gives you a something that is not way off at the same time cannot get into the granularity of the data, which is important, agreed. Another important thing I think we must keep in mind is lack of data. And I'm saying this when you have state representatives over here, it is very, very difficult to get comparable data across states. And this was why we, in fact, we opted to drop the index you know, the pillar of land. Land is something that very fundamental you would assume, because capital, if you look at the three labor factors of production, land, labor, and capital. As, Capital availability should not be very different across states, even though number of bank branches is always taken or very often taken, because most large advances are never sanctioned at the branch level. All large advances are sanctioned at the head office level or the of the bank concern. It just happens that the disbursement is, you know, the actual dispersal is done at the state level. So number of branches is frankly quite irrelevant at the state level as far as interstate differences are concerned. So capital we did not take for that reason. Land, when we tried to find out how much land was available, we found it an almost impossible exercise. In fact, we, it, you know, for almost the first two, three months, we you know, hit our head against the wall, trying to get comparable data across states. So what is the kind of land that is available? What is the kind of non-arable land? What is the land available in SEZs? Even in terms of definition of SEZs, you know, national manufacturing zones, we found such huge variations across state. So we finally opted to drop land for the simple reason that I think now a lot of states have become very, you know, innovative in, in getting land. If you are sufficiently interested, that's a good thing that's come about courtesy all this, you know, competitive, cooperative federalism, is that states, if they want an industry to come, as we've seen in the case of Fox Run, they will make the land available for a large enough industry. And for a small industry, land is not really a problem. As we've seen in the case of Andhra, where we, for the state capital, Amravati, Chandrababu Naidu, who has been very innovative in getting land, doing, going through land pooling to get land. So lack of data, the fact that you know, there are ways and means available, states can get land, so we opted to drop land also. So I think lack of data is a very fundamental point when trying to kind of, you know, get any any such index, compile any index. So that is why same weightage across because it's very far too complicated in the search of getting, so that is the first thing. Why did we not take service industry? Service industry we have not taken, finally, for three reasons, because actually we wanted to kind of get be we saw this as some kind of an input into the make in India. And make in India, the fundamental thing is about increasing the share of manufacturing to 25%. And again, manufacturing is still seen, despite the fact that we are a service-driven economy, manufacturing is still seen as a sector which gives jobs. If you want to take a man off farms and put him into any kind of non-farm activity, you don't put him in front of a computer because he requires a certain amount of minimal skills. So jobs have to come in manufacturing. So since the focus of the entire economic growth purpose, purpose really is not jobless growth, but jobs, you know, growth with jobs, we focused on manufacturing again. Investment again, the whole idea of this, we're looking at the investment potential. Now, it's a not correct to make generalizations, but broadly, if you were to make to speak, I'm, I'm sorry for saying broadly after saying not correct to make generalizations, is that manufacturing is a sector which requires more investment rather than services. So for these three reasons, because we wanted to gel with Make in India, because we were looking at job creation, we were looking at investment, hence we looked focused on manufacturing rather than the service sector. Which brings me, I think, to the last point, uh, which was something about, as I said, the mismatch between the objective and the subjective parameters. And this is where I'm hoping that maybe post the discussions, we'll be able to fine tune our subjective parameters because there are two reasons why this mismatch could have happened. Possibly in our survey, which is where the subjective element comes out, possibly we have not asked the right questions. Possibly the questions are not framed properly because you must remember that a lot of times the people 
uh, the respondents understanding of your question which is why surveys always lead to so much of discussion and debate his understanding of the question that you asked may not be what you intended also it is quite possible that even though we talk of 10011 which is a large number in terms of robustness of a survey maybe when you talk about state level comparisons the number in each state is not sufficiently representative so that's why i'm hoping that in post this discussion tell us how do we fine tune the kind of things that we have included in our survey so that this sometimes is obvious mismatch in some cases yes the mismatch is understandable but some cases yes there are questions that are raised by the mismatch which seem very fundamental and maybe it is because we need to fine tune our survey and that's why i'm hoping that you will help us out when one last question to clear about gujarat you know how many businessmen we do have data if you look at the detailed data on page 189 tells you which has a state wise thing it tells you that in gujarat 64 65 percent, roughly, of the people did not want to move out of Gujarat, so they were fairly happy worth working in Gujarat. But it is a perception, as I said. Surveys have a number of drawbacks. So, it, so with that, I think I'll come to the end of my this thing, and we really look forward to having more suggestions. Really, very good suggestions we've received, and hopefully, we'll be able to incorporate them next time. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'll now just invite uh, Mr. Avishek to say something. Uh, just a couple of suggestions uh, I'd like to make uh, for your next year study. Uh, you can get perhaps the data about how much of investment has actually come into various states, foreign investment as well as domestic investments, how many factories have been set up, how many have actually closed down, because perceptions are important, but actually these uh, hard facts up to how much of investment has actually come into which state is also very important. And connected with this point also is the fact that despite many constraints of land and labor and capital, etc., uh, there are many state governments which are aggressively pursuing the investment promotion work. So they make sure that they handhold the investors and potential investors and see them through the entire maze of issues and problems and approvals and all that. So they make available land on a priority basis. They give incentives to large investors, etc. So many of the actual the investment potential also comes from how keen the states are to in, um, uh, promote investment. So maybe there could be some indicator somewhere, uh, you have to see whether it's possible about the investment promotion efforts and the intensity of that effort by the states. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, now I'll invite uh, now Mr. Jha and then Mr. Deepak, just a, a line each so that because we're running short of time uh, in response to the question that was asked. Okay, actually no clear cut question was asked of me, but I okay. think Mr. Shah did mention my name in passing. <laughs> so I, I will, <laughs> I will, uh, try to answer what I think was the question. <laughs> no, no, I'll, 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 I'll try and answer what I thought was your question. I think you, you basically refer to the fact that there are certain industries like pharma, gems and jewelry, uh, which are really driven by policies from the central government and state governments have a very limited role to play. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Corruption, no, I've, no, I've noted that one also. I was going to come to that. But uh, I think, Deepak, if you would like to answer the first one, you may. Otherwise, I'll just make one quick comment since I've been told we are short of time. And that quick comment is that, see, you wanted to have a, some comparison of the functioning of the central government. That's already being done by the World Bank and other international agencies. They compare the government of India vis-a-vis -vis other governments. So, you know, that kind of comparison already exists. As far as the corruption element is concerned, see, my comment really ba was based on what came out in the survey, that very large numbers of respondents said corruption was the main issue. In fact, uh, when the slide was put up, uh, I was quite aghast to see that in Tamil Nadu, 100 percent of the respondents said that corruption was the major issue. Now, this is remarkable. It cuts across levels. It cuts across lower level, higher level, medium level. So I think uh, this is something which really one needs to look at very closely. Thank you. Yeah, please. Thank you. There, has, there have been a lot of very insightful observations. But the question of Mr. Shah, it's true that in pharma and telecom and electronics, the central government does most of the regulation. But I do not agree that the state's role is limited. Take, for example, telecom. All regulation is done by government of India, but the critical parameter for success is enforcing commitments made by states. And I allude to the right of way. If you have to lay fiber and if you have to install a telecom tower, states are not able to implement commitments made, you know, 
some kind of clamor on the basis of health reasons or others will lead to shutdown of towers in large numbers. And then there is complaint of coil drops. It's like saying I will not allow the water tank to be established on my rooftop, but I want 24 into 7 water supply. The other point is, states being crucial, is incentives. See, we in India have disabilities as far as industry is concerned. And I would, in the air, telecom, IT, electronic sector, even say it is 10 to 12 percent. Competitiveness for exports is possible only if we make up for this disability, and that is done through incentives. And the states, as Ramesh Abhishek was pointing out, compete on incentives. Take the case of Foxconn. They are wanting to set up a plant. They have a wish list, which is two meters long, and they are going to states from Andhra to Maharashtra to Haryana to UP and Gujarat, trying to see what incentives states give. So these two, and incentives is perhaps another area which would uh, be, which is uh, important for decisions regarding where investment is made, especially for the small, medium sector, and in areas where obsolescence and risk is high. So this is, uh, I think the role of states is critical. And the same with pharma. I mean, pharma, st the state drug controller, the role that they have in the implementation part of it, they may have nothing to do with policy, perhaps is very important in success or otherwise of industry and the climate of the state. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this brings me to the end of this session. And I will end it with uh, two remarks. First remark is that uh, of all the different indicators which uh, was pointed out, it says land is an area where data problems are quite serious. I do not think at present in the statistical system there is scope for getting such data. There is, But if it has to be done, I don't know how, how best to do it. But uh, a, having a good quality data in terms of land availability, charges, and all these things uh, would be useful. Which institution should do it is not clear to me. But uh, this is certainly one area which uh, um, perhaps some recommendation could be made to the Ministry of Statistics that this is an area where data needed or there can be an initiative directly from the state. The second observation is that perception-based surveys do provide very good deal of information, which this one has. Uh, but uh, we need a much bigger sample than what is covered here with, with thousand all over the country is but can there be state level cooperation in this? In that, uh, if NCR is the sort of nodal agency doing this survey, and if it is, of course, it has to be designed more scientifically than what's done. But if there is cooperation from the state, and see if states think that these data are important and they are ready to provide support, I think the scale of the survey can be made much larger. It will be useful also for the states because they will get their own uh, information on their own what the businessmen there and the entrepreneurs there think. I think these are the two important uh, takeaways from me from this uh, research which needs uh, action. So I thank you very much. I thank you for the session, the writer, the paper presenters and the discussions. Thank you. And, and thank you yourself, Professor Goldar, uh, for uh, steering a very interesting session. Uh, Professor Goldar, for those of you who don't know him, of course, uh, ICSSR fellow at the uh, Institute of Economic Growth and a long career there, but he's also very much at the heart of uh, CSO's uh, work on uh, statistics and national income accounts and a range of other issues. So uh, I, we'll, I'm, I'm sure that we'll be hearing a lot from Professor Goldar as we try and struggle with another conundrum on the national income national income accounts. I think we are uh, ripe for a cup of coffee. Um, and we come back at 11.45. So coffee is served, I think, in the room adjoining us there. Um, so please uh, come back uh, by 11.45. And then we'll start getting into uh, some of the more detailed discussions and comparisons with the complementary indices that we have been talking about, the World Bank's ease of doing business, and also uh, the DIPP's assessment that happened last year and it's ongoing. So please join us at 11.45 again. And thank you all. Thank you.